uh, in this place. If you have your Bible tonight, Ezekiel chapter 16. And uh, Ruth Graham, uh, Billy Graham's wife, died uh, June 14, 2007. And before her death, uh, she made this statement to her husband. She said, Billy, if God doesn't come soon and bring judgment upon the United States, uh, he'll have to go back and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> 2012, Billy Graham says, I wonder what Ruth would think of America if she were alive today. My heart aches for deceived America. Made a few statements, almost 60 million babies, innocent lives aborted. Self-centeredness, indulgence, pride, a lack of shame over sin are now the emblems of the American lifestyle. Christian chaplains, the military ordered to no longer mention the name of Jesus in prayer, but use the term, the being in the room. I just uh, preached five sermons and uh, uh, felt uh, almost a prophetic unction and I'm going to try to give you the Reader's Digest. Pray for me tonight that I don't go too long. <laughs> Friday, June the 26th, 2015. Five Supreme Court judges, powered by Justice Kennedy, made same-sex marriage right of the Constitution over the 50 states of America. Justice Scalia said, the arrogance that every state for 135 years violated the Constitution. That these men are smarter than all the Supreme Court justice for the last 135 years. To say that any citizen who agrees with the Bible in all generations and governments of every nation in history is wrong. Listen to these words is the height of egotistical arrogance and pride. They have descended from the discipline of legal reasoning to a mystical fortune cookie. And my question tonight is, have we crossed the line with God? Where the righteous nature of God now demands his wrath. I know there's many nations represented here tonight, but I feel God would have me minister. Has America gone too far? Ezekiel 16, verse 49 and 50. <clears throat> Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty, committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. Father, tonight we come by the blood. God, we come by the Holy Ghost and your power, God, and your word. God, I pray, give us revelation. God, stir our hearts in these last days, God. In the sovereignty of your will, God. God, I pray, raise us up. God, I pray, break the bondage. God, stir men and women in this place tonight to stand in righteousness, to venture to the corners of the earth in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to think with me tonight about the nature of God. Who God is. What's the fabric of God's character? His essence. Otherwise, these qualities of God that make Him who He is. The state, they make this declaration of His personality, His attributes. 
Because the Bible and Jesus Christ um, is a revelation that reveals who God is. And we know God is many things. He's all power, all present wisdom. There's love, there's mercy, there's grace, there's healing, there's deliverance, there's salvation. And we love to make that quote, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is true. But what about when it comes to God being a moral God? Is He the same today as He was a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, two thousand years ago? In character and conduct, God is moral in judgment. When it comes to what's right and what's wrong, His name, His very name, the Lord our righteousness. I want you to listen. Our God is a holy God. And that means something. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourself you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Sacred holy, undefiled, pure. To put away the profane, in behavior and conduct and language. So the question is, when you see God, when you think about God, do you see holy? Isaiah, Pastor Scott Lamb ministered on this, Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. Here is this man in God's presence. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. His train, the train of His robe filled the temple. Here are angels and all of this. But, and these angels cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And when He saw that dimension of God, a holy God, He saw Himself, Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of a nation of unclean lips. Holy as in separation unto God and His will. Moses in Exodus 3. Again, he's in the presence of God. The bush is burning. He turns aside to see this unusual event. And the voice of God said, Moses, I want you to take off your shoes. Because the place where you're standing is holy ground. What do you see tonight in this tent? Have a holy Bible, Holy Spirit, Holy God. When you think God, do you think this holiness, the holiness of God, makes Him judge in righteous justice? Deuteronomy 32 4, He is the rock. His work is perfect. All His ways are justice. A God of truth without injustice. Righteous and upright is He. In other words, He cannot change who He is for you, for me, for America. You can change your doctrine to accommodate your sin. The Supreme Court, they can change the laws of the land, but that will not change God. God sets boundaries in His righteousness. He sets limitations. Uh, it began in the Garden of Eden. He set His creation in the Garden. And He said, all the trees of this paradise you can partake of, but this tree, I'm setting a boundary on you. Don't partake of that tree. If you do, you're going to, don't cross that line. 
The Ten Commandments are God's revelation for living life. Uh, And in Exodus 20, again we see these boundaries. In other words, a righteous God, the nature of God, uh, He set boundaries in a sin world. It's true in nature. It's true in the universe, in the planets, in the ocean tides. Gravity, it's true in economics. Anybody with any sense understands there's rules and laws that govern life. Debt to income, the great crisis of 2008 was because they violated that law. Hospitals have hygiene. Uh, You go to get a driver's license, there's rules of the road. Uh, But how much more true is it when it comes to a moral God? heard Pastor Mitchell say for years, our God is a moral God and He rules in a moral universe. And the wages of sin is death. Doesn't always happen immediately, but somewhere sin must be judged. We understand the cross and the blood, uh, the price that was paid for sin. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, who, he who rejects this does not reject men, but God who is also giving us His Holy Spirit. Is this in your heart? When you speak, when you make decisions, your eyes, your conduct, your behavior, is this your prayer? I'm perfecting God, you help me in righteousness because we live in an hour when a generation is being unraveled morally. Has America gone too far? Has your nation gone too far? In this nation, we're not talking about a nation who never knew God. Proverbs 14, 33, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Psalms 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people, he has cleansed his his own inheritance. In this nation, in our money, it says, in God we trust. We sing, God bless America. We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Our first president, there's statues and paintings of this man, George Washington, on his knees in prayer. You go to our Washington, D.C., our national capital. You go to the Senate, the House, the monuments, the Supreme Court. And it's filled with Bible verses and quotes, paintings and statues, holding Bibles and water baptisms. Every session of Congress begins with a prayer. Every president lays his hand on this holy book at his inauguration. So we must ask the question, what brings a righteous God to wrath? What pushes God into a corner that provokes his righteous anger? And one of the things that is so dangerous and the beginning of this path is when a nation or people begin to forget God. Deuteronomy 8.11 Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, His statutes which I command you today. You have eaten and are full, He says. You have built beautiful houses and you dwell in them. Your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. In this nation and many nations, the last few decades have been incredible prosperity and blessing. You know, when I was a boy, 
We had no closets in our home because we had no clothes. I remember a nail on the wall was my closet. Uh, no junk food. I can remember no refrigerator. No appliances, no TV, all of these things. And he went on, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Verse 17, then you say in your heart, my power, the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. I can remember as a, as a boy again, there was nothing open on Sunday. It was the Lord's Day. I was involved in a lot of sports, but there was no games or anything on Wednesday that was prayer meeting. I can remember any major school event, there was always a pastor there to pray and many times to give some kind of speech. Justice Scalis, it is the height of egotistical arrogance and pride for these five men. Deuteronomy said, I want you to remember the Lord your God. The mark of an individual, a generation, or a nation, the mark of stepping away is they begin to forget God. We don't want anything that reminds us of God. We don't want to see the Bible. We don't want to see the Ten Commandments. We don't want to hear the name of Jesus. You will not pray in the schools. We don't want you talking about Bible truth in our schools. Just recently, the IRS targeted Ben Carson and his brother after his prayer breakfast speech. Public schools say Jesus' t-shirt is a hate speech. Florida professor demanding a student to stomp on Jesus. Ryan... Rotella in conflict with his professor over religious beliefs. He was told by his professor to write Jesus Christ's name on a piece of paper and then told him to throw it into the floor and stomp on it. Just recently in Oklahoma, I'm going to rip the Ten Commandments, this monument right out of the ground. June 25th, 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court decided to remove prayer from the public school. Listen to me, listen to me. They have no idea what they've loosed by the Supreme Court decision. Fifty years ago, they made another decision, you will not pray in the schools. Now, 20 million new sexually transmitted infections in the United States each year. Young people between the age of 15 and 28 account for 50% of all of the new STD infections. The U.S. has the highest rate of sexually transmitted infections in the industrial world. It's an epidemic. Teen suicide, 5,400 attempts each day. Since they removed prayer from the schools, teen pregnancy increased 553%. Sexually transmitted disease up 226%. Divorce up 300%. Violent crime up 544%. 60 million abortions. The prison population is up uh, over 50% in the last 30 years. Psalms 127.1, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman watches in vain. I want to say something here to every father. Listen, listen, dad, listen, mom. If you're not careful, your compromise becomes your child's passion. You play with porno, they're obsessed with perversion. Listen, you lower the standard. You compromise. 
you lower the bar, that becomes their height of conviction. What about in this tent? So what brought judgment? In Noah's day and in Sodom and Gomorrah, sexual perversion. Genesis 6, 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. They were beautiful. They took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. These beings from the spirit world, I'm not sure all that was involved. But they were sexually involved with the daughters of men. And a line was crossed. And the Bible says the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And the flood came. To say we don't want to even think about God. We don't want anything to remind us of God. And then to begin to violate God's righteousness in marriage. God says there'll be no adulterers, fornicators, perverts enter into my kingdom. And here in both Noah's day and in Sodom's day, this text in Ezekiel, Sodom, Sodom she and her daughters had pride and they committed an abomination. This word, it's, it's disgusting, it's loathing, it's unclean. It's perverse, it's obscene, it's detestable. You know the story in Genesis 19. Here are angels, some feel the Lord himself. Bring them out that we may know them. One translation, that we may rape them, sodomize them. Second Peter 2.6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Condemn them to destruction making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Jude 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them in similar manner to those having given themselves over to sexual immorality. And they went after strong, strange flesh. They are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Romans 1. And what compounds this is not just the act or the deed, but the approval with no shame. The applaud of wickedness. Romans 1, 32, Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they do the same, but they also approve those who practice them. Just recently, this happened in America, the, the White House. At night, they had these, this rainbow of colors applauding this decision. What a shake your fist in the face of God. Facebook, 26 million changed to the rainbow filter. City halls, the embassy in London, Isaiah 520, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Jeremiah 6.15, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. School system, CBN News, warning, these eighth graders will soon be receiving lessons on oral and anal sex. Fourth graders will receive instruction about incest. The goal is to teach students about homosexuality, bisexual, and transgender identity. Starting in kindergarten, students will be taught about same-sex or gay marriage. The parents will not be able to opt out. Andrea? Lafaretti, president of the Traditional Values Coalition, told CBN News. It's amazing to me 
that the whole homosexual movement chose a rainbow as their symbol. The arrogance, if you know anything about that in Genesis 9 when God destroyed the world by flood, came to know and he said, I've set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. What a mockery. I've said that to bring you to this place. God is still sovereign. God is a sovereign God. They can pass all the laws they want. They can exalt, they can fill the media, they can applaud them, wicked, but our God is a sovereign God, and we have a responsibility. There are two streams of prophetic scripture as we step into these last days. We know judgment is coming. Men's hearts will grow worse and worse. Paul, the falling away comes first. Uh, mystery of lawlessness. Uh, the absence of rule. Uh, strong delusion. Uh, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 6, because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon them. We know in the book of Revelation the horsemen are, are mounting up. The seals, the vials, all of these. These things are happening. We know it's good, but right in the same stream, coexisting right in the middle of that insanity, God is going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. You cannot read Joel without reading this. You cannot read history. When the great revival of the early church, the Roman Empire was wicked beyond belief. Is God looking for a Jonah tonight in this place? Nineveh, a wicked city, ungodliness, perversion, this massive capital city of the Babylonian Empire, sacrificing their own children. And he looks for a man. He looks for a couple. He looks for Jonah. He said, their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. I want you to rise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and I want you to cry out against it. Can God come to you tonight? Can God come to you tonight? Like he came to Jonah. Can God interrupt your plans? Your desires. Your comfort zone. The Bible says, And the Lord came to Jonah a second time. How many times does God have to come? <coughs> We know God is going to pour out His Spirit in the last days. You've heard me say in times past, I believe God has positioned our fellowship to be a powerful instrument in the last day move of God. But it's not automatic. Just me saying it doesn't make it happen. He said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Think of this. This man preached a sermon, eight words. Eight words. Eight simple words. Yet forty days Nineveh shall be overthrown, or Nineveh shall be destroyed. And this massive city, those eight words anointed by God and a man surrendered to God that entire city from the king all the way 
they begin to repent. They begin to fast. They begin to cry out. And God spared the city. Oh, we know God is sovereign, but I believe our obedience has an influence on God's timing and sovereignty. I believe that as you and I, if we will respond and see, oh, we're not ignorant of the hour in which we live, and, but in the midst of that, will you be like Isaiah? Oh, I saw God and I saw myself. But then I said, here am I, send me. Can, can you say that to God tonight, sir? Do you see the wickedness of these nations and cities? These masses of humanity? And at our fingertips today, because of the modernization, you can get on a plane, you can take your family. It doesn't take a year to get there. There are resources at our fingertips. We can plant churches. We can change nations. But we cannot do that without men and women that will say yes. God, here am I. Send me. In the New Testament, there's a story, and I close. There's a man on the Jericho Road. This man is beaten. He's stripped. We live in a generation that are being stripped. Their morals, their hope, their purity, their minds their marriages, their children, stripped. I'll never forget some time ago, one Sunday morning, this little girl came to the altar. She might have been 16 years old. She had three children around her. I could tell all three of them had a different father. And here she is. She's barely a kid herself. She's weeping. I, after that service, I, I kind of stepped down from the pulpit. To, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk to her, and I looked at her, and she lifted her face and looked at me. And when I looked in her eyes, it was like I was looking in the eyes of a 60, 70-year-old woman. And she said, Pastor, is there any hope for me? This man's stripped. He's bleeding. And he's been left for dead. That's the hour you and I live in. That's the people who come through the doors of our church. That's the mass of humanity. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It is worse. Can you hear the silent scream? This man in the story... He has no name. He has no voice. Is there a silent scream going up from the earth to God tonight? But can you and I hear it? We know God is moved. But are you moved? Because if we're not careful, we can be like the priest and the Levite. Or we can see Him. We can describe Him. We can preach sermons about Him. But really we walk on by. We walk on by. And we can give our theological reasons why we do not respond to the call of nations and cities New York City, Chicago, Houston, China, India, Europe, Latin America, Brazil.
God said in Ezekiel, Oh, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. I found none. So where are you tonight in the story? Are you the Samaritan that says, you know what? I can't walk by this. I can't just ignore this. Are you like Jonah? A prophet in name, but running from the will of God? Are you like the priest and the Levite? You have ministry. You have religious affiliation. But when it comes to the mess of humanity, oh, God is sovereign. God, I don't care, they cannot stop God. But you and I, we can move the hand of God in the arena of time. And we have to choose. Is God going to use us in this great outpouring in the last day? I ask you to bow your head with me this evening.